everyone. Welcome to Thought Crime and Keto and Crime. Today got a very great story for you. Um, we're going to delve into two of my favorite subjects, religion and murder. And where we have a, a much publicized trial from uh, the early 2000s in which a uh, preacher's wife murders a preacher. And we're going to talk about it today on Keto and Crime. We've got the case of Mary Winkler. It's going to be great. But before we dive into that, a little bit of an explanation. I know that I had said that Chad Daybell's next novel would be uh, coming up this weekend. I did not have time to finish it with um, my day jobs are very busy around the holidays, so I did not have a chance to dive in and finish it. So I thought I would bring up two uh, cases this weekend that I have been uh, researching for in an ongoing way. That is Mary Winkler and Ruby Ridge. So those will be uh, this weekend's offerings, as well as a uh, very personal video that will be coming out on either Monday or Tuesday. So uh, nothing's wrong, just... Just got a bit of a shock this week, and I wanted to share it with you, so I'll, I'll be telling you all about that. But uh, I promise you the last two Daybell novels will be coming up over Christmas weekend and New Year's weekend. We will ring in the new year with Chad Daybell. Anyway, and since this weekend will be the last opportunity that I have to speak to you guys before Christmas, because Christmas Eve is only four days away at this point, um, five days away, I just wanted to wish you all a very happy holiday, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah to all those that have just celebrated Hanukkah, a Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Solstice, whatever you celebrate, I wish you the very best for a healthy and happy one. Uh, 2020 has been kind of a dumpster fire. I'm kind of glad to see it go. Hopefully 2021 will bring new hope for new, new and better things for us all. And uh, with that, I just wanted to say a very, very happy holidays and a very big thank you to my patrons and my channel members. You know who you are. I couldn't do this without you. You make this channel move forward along with everyone that watches my videos. I really appreciate it. So if I have not earned your subscription, please do that today. Also, give me a like, give me a share, comment. Um, the comments on the Jody Arias videos were great. I really enjoyed. And I wanted to address um, a longtime subscriber of mine. You know who you are. I'm not going to mention any names, but accused me of um, victim shaming when I talked about uh, putting some blame on Travis uh, for what happened. And I'm going to stand by that opinion. Uh, I do not victim shame. Uh, if this had been a marriage situation or, you know, just something that happened out of the blue, of course, I would not never have even mentioned a victim's part in causing it. But Travis knowingly again and again put himself into uh, a dangerous situation uh, with somebody that was stalking him, slashing his tires, breaking into his home uh, over a period of months. Uh, he even, you know was still engaging in an intimate relationship with her right up to the moment he died. So you have to admit that some personal responsibility does play into that particular crime, but that is a one-off. I, I would never, for the most part, blame a victim for anything that happens. It's just that one was so in your face. If you a, have a common sense, you have to address it. So that's what I was saying. But anyway, I just wanted to put that out there. I'm pretty sure I've lost that subscriber, and, you know, uh, I wish her, her luck on her journey. But I just wanted to say that I wanted to let it be known I am not a victim shamer. It was just that particular case. I could not help but comment on it, what was in a lot of people's faces as we went through that story. And with that being said, let's move on. Please, if you... Uh, if you are subscribed, check, make sure you're still subscribed, still some YouTube shenanigans going on. And with that, let's get into the case of Mary and Matthew Winkler. Mary Carol Freeman, eventually Winkler, 
was born December 10th, 1973, in, uh, near Knoxville, Tennessee, at Fort Sanders Presbyterian Hospital. She was the daughter of Clark Bransford Freeman and his wife, Mary Neal Freeman, and was one of many children in a family that included both biological children and up to five adopted children over the course of Mary's growing up. Uh, the Freemans had lost Mary's younger sister, Patricia, um, when she was about eight years old, and they started adopting other children as a result, giving them quite a huge family. I will drop uh, a link to a great uh, PDF uh, timeline of Mary Winkler's life that I, I happened upon in line, please, from the Jackson Sun. It's a local small town Tennessee newspaper. I will drop that down below, so definitely give them a look. But Mary grew up in a pretty traditional working class environment. Her father made a good living. Her mother was a homemaker, and they were very strictly religious, uh, belonging to the Church of Christ. Her father was a deacon in that denomination, and that religion was part of her growing up. In fact, she, she kind of delved into it, was very... Uh, she loved the discipline that being Church of Christ kind of re requires. I am going to get into what the Church of Christ is in just a few minutes. But let's just say that it was a huge part of Mary's uh, growing up, and she never quite left it. She did quite well in school. She always wanted to be a teacher. And at the age of 18, she uh, decided to pursue that goal and study education. In 1992, she graduated from South Doyle High School in the Knoxville area and eventually transfers or attends or applies at David Lipscomb University, another religious university in another a Church of Christ affiliated school near Nashville, Tennessee. And then after one year transferred to uh, Hendersonville, Tennessee, or Henderson, Tennessee, uh, to another Church of Christ school called Freed Hardeman. And that is where she would meet the man that would become her husband and eventually her victim uh, Matthew Winkler. Matthew Winkler was born Matthew Brian Winkler, November 21st, 1974, uh, in Denlo, Nevada. His parents moved around a lot, and he was raised primarily in uh, Decatur, uh, Alabama, Woodbury, Tennessee, and Huntington, Tennessee. He what came from a long line of Church of Christ pastors. In fact, he what his family were four generations of pastors deep, and so the entire time that Matthew went to school, uh, went to high school, he he was a college athlete, played football, wrestled, did a lot of uh, really athletic things. But he's his goal was to become a Church of Christ minister, like his father, like his grandfather, like his great grandfather. And as a result, he had a very sheltered growing up. He wasn't even allowed to attend his senior prom because there might be dancing there. So a very, very strict growing up for both Mary Freeman and Matthew Winkler. And it would be this love and affiliation with the Church of Christ that would bring them together at Fareed Hardeman University because that is where Matthew went after graduating to pursue a ministerial degree. Now, Fareed Hardeman is a fundamentalist uh, Church of Christ school. It has some traditional majors, but among the top ones are uh, minister ministerial studies for the Church of Christ, as well as education, which is why Mary was there. Now, before we delve back into their story, let's talk a little bit about the Church of Christ. It is a um, American denomination, though it does have some uh, churches in Europe. It has its roots, roots in the Restoration Movement, and basically it operates on the premise that the whole the whole spectrum of different types of denominations and even major types of religion like Protestantism versus Catholicism is against the Bible. They believe that Christ established one church, the Christian church, the Church of Christ, and they believe that they are that church. So that everyone else is wrong, every other denomination is wrong, the Catholics are wrong, the Jews are wrong, everyone is wrong but them. And that's just the short and sweet of it. I have family members that are Church of Christ, I love them dearly, they're very nice people, but I'm just telling the truth about the denomination. 
They have very, very strict views of the Bible and take it quite literally, such as they believe in a very strict code of conduct for men and women. They believe that the church's leadership should be in male members as well as the household. Uh, they believe that any statement that would give you loyalty to a particular denomination or church is wrong, that your loyalty should be to Christ and the Bible. All There's a lot of honesty in what they teach, I'll be quite honest. Um, they believe that weekly communion is a Christian's right and duty, and they do that every single Sunday, whereas a lot of other denominations only do it on you know, particular types of Sundays, like Easter. Um, they believe in no instrumental music whatsoever. They take that from Ephesians 5.19, where it talks about make a joyful noise with your voice into the Lord, and they believe that any instrumental music in church is wrong. Uh, so that's kind of the environment that uh, Mary and Matthew Winkler grew up in. Uh, very defined social roles for uh, men and women, uh, certain styles of dress for men and women, though they, their women in the Church of Christ can wear pants and for the most part, it's not like the Pentecostal movement that I grew up in. They don't believe in the speaking in tongues. Just a very, very strict type of worship. And that's the type of environment that these two grew up in. And then they continued on with that in their college years. First when Mary went to David Lipscomb, a Church of Christ school, and then transferred to Fried Hardeman, where she met Matthew. Now, Fried Hardeman, which is now no longer in existence, it did go out of, uh, out of business like a lot of private... Uh, Religious schools, uh, that will be the subject of my Monday video. I got a very disturbing email from my own alma mater, which is a Southern Baptist school. We'll talk about that. But uh, it, it basically enforced these types of stereotypes. You know, men at, at the school, uh, women were required to wear uh, dresses in class. The, the men wore suit and ties. They attended chapel. Uh, very defined. There was absolutely no like public displays of affection, no, nothing that could be constituted as uh, promoting sexualized behavior, so no dancing, certainly no frats or sororities or, or, or wild parties or anything like that. But that was the atmosphere that both Mary and Matthew liked. In fact, Matthew, who had been extremely popular in high school, found the same type of environment at Freed Hardeman. He was quite a looker, and I'll drop a picture of both him and Mary here from their early days. They were, you know, they, they were both quite attractive, but uh, a lot of women at Freed Hardeman, you know, pursued what was, I, I, I feel like I'm trouncing back into Daybill territory here, but they would um, go into traditionally female jobs, uh, teaching, nursing, uh, things of that nature where, you know, still, but still the primary objective of a female was to become a wife and mother, and that was kind of what Fried Hardeman taught. Yes, you can have a career to an extent, but your main job is to become a wife and mother and raise more children for the kingdom of God. And Mary had never really thought about being a wife and mother, but once she met Matthew, that all changed for her, and they, they were instantly attracted to each other. She, he was the first boy that she ever brought home to meet her parents in Knoxville when they traveled from West Tennessee to East Tennessee for the holidays, but uh, one of Mary's sisters uh, would later on say that she had a very disturbing conversation with Matthew during that first holiday that he was staying with them where uh, her and her uh, sister Mary had always been super close. Uh, Matthew basically told her point blank when Mary wasn't around, of course, that uh, once they get married, that uh, Mary will be his, not hers, and that he will take primary precedence in her life and that she needs to understand that. There won't be any more late night phone calls and gallivanting around. I can only imagine the reaction of my sisters or me if any of our partners ever told each other that. There would be a fight. But uh, anyway, that came out later that he did indeed take that uh, poise with her sister. I doubt he said that to her parents. Uh, he did ask her father permission to uh, propose, which he was given. And uh, 
they were married in 1996, uh, before Matthew even graduated. Uh, Mary actually ended her studies at Fred Hardeman, and even though they were still living in Henderson, she went to work at several menial jobs, such as uh, working in restaurants, dry cleaners, those types of jobs to help support the family while Matthew finished his ministerial degree at Fred Hardeman. In 1997, their oldest daughter, Patricia, was born, and they quickly followed with Allie in 1999, and then a few years later, Brianna in 2005. So they did not wait very long at all to start a family. So Mary became, even though she was still the primary breadwinner, she did busy herself with making a home for Matthew and their girls as well. Now, when Matthew finally graduated from Fried Hardeman, uh, he immediately uh, received an offer to become a, a youth pastor in Louisiana. They did uh, move uh, to Louisiana where he took on those duties, but unfortunately, Youth pastors are not very well paid. In fact, a lot of Church of Christ head ministers are not that well paid. It depends on the size of the church and the donation structure and what they have to offer. So as a youth pastor, he was literally starting on the lowest rung. I think that's kind of the thing with most denominations when you start, you start as a youth pastor. And so this was essentially a full-time commitment to the church with part-time salary. So Matthew... Uh, was trying to build his reputation, build his, uh, kind of build his practice as a minister so that he can eventually take on the head of a church. But so he was delved into that because it, along with youth pastoring, it's not just conducting the youth church. It's uh, basically developing after school activities, weekend activities, being a counselor, being a mentor, visiting the sick. A lot of stuff goes into pastoring beyond just preaching on Sunday, which he did to the youth. And he also kind of coordinated Bible school, of which Mary was a teacher in the Bible school. But as a result, he was only making a part-time salary, and Mary was left to still be the primary breadwinner, which she was by working, again, mostly minimum wage or lower paid jobs. And uh, the stress was a lot on Mary. She, she was not only taking care of the home, but helping pay the bills. And they never had a whole lot. They did run up a significant credit card debt, uh, like a lot of young couples do. And Matthew, according to most people, even though he put on a great face at the church, was not uh, always a pleasant person to be around. Uh, one of their neighbors in Louisiana complained that he threatened to shoot their dog when the dog just simply wandered into their yard. I mean, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what a, a neighbor alleged. I'm just giving you the research that I, that I have here. And that uh, one time while they were home visiting uh, Mary's family, her father, Clark, noticed some bruises around her neck and asked uh, Mary, you look like you've been beat. What's going on? And he wanted to know. Her father was mad, as my father would have been. And she says, no, Dad, I'm going to work it out. Don't worry about it. So from that time on, the respect that Mary's family had for Matthew kind of dwindled. And uh, things relatively got tough. Mary got homesick for Tennessee, so eventually Matthew found another youth pastor job closer to East Tennessee in a little town called McMinnville. It's actually closer to West Tennessee, but it's there. And he went, they, they lived there for a while, again, as a youth pastor, only making a part-time type of salary, leaving uh, Mary to work in a local dry cleaners there to support the family. And finally, in 2005, just before the birth of their youngest daughter, Brianna, uh, they got a an offer from another Western Tennessee town Church of Christ in Selmer, Tennessee, for him to take over the church as the head pastor. Selmer, Tennessee is named after Selma, Alabama. So Selma, Selmer. And it is in McNary County, Tennessee, which it was popularized uh, by the sheriff of Walking Tall fame, Buford Pusser. So this was the same area where Buford Pusser carried on an all-out war with the Dixie Mafia from 1964 to 1970. If you have never seen the original, I'm not talking the modern one with The Rock, the original with Joe Don Baker, you need to go see that immediately because it is awesome. But anyway, so this is the area where 
uh, Mary and Matthew Wrinkler are located for him to take on the pulpit or head pastor job at the Fourth Street Church of Christ. It was a church of about 200 people with a decent amount of tithes coming in. And the greatest thing to Mary was the fact that they actually had a, a parsonage, a church own house for the head preacher that they could live in rent free as part of their salary. So even though the money wasn't very much better than what he had been making as a youth pastor, at least they didn't have to worry about a rent payment. And uh, I'm going to drop a picture of that parsonage right here. Just after they got there and got settled, they acclimated themselves into the church. They were well-liked. They seemed to be a perfect couple. However, um, their youngest daughter, Brianna, came a couple of months early, which kind of resulted in a very long hospital stay for Mary and the baby. And that led to a lot of medical bills that were not covered by their insurance plan. So that was a lot of new stress on the, on the young couple. People at church showed that even though Mary was outwardly nice, that her eyes looked sad all the time and she seemed tired. She also, uh, once their baby was well and kind of over the trauma of being born premature, Mary begged Matthew for the chance to go back to school which he allowed her. She had to go before the church elders to make sure that was okay, but they deemed that it was okay, especially since it was for a teaching degree, which is a appropriate uh, job for a pastor's wife. Don't get me started. I'm sure it's not all denominations, but don't get me started. Um, so she started uh, working on her... Uh, teaching degree again at a local college and also uh, started doing some substitute teaching for the local uh, elementary school. So she was able to bring in a little more money to help them and uh, things seemed to be going well. But Mary wasn't real worldly. She was kind of naive in a, in a lot of ways, even though uh, she had been the breadwinner for so long. Um, and basically took care of all of paying all the bills. She wasn't real sophisticated when it comes to uh, money and scams. And she found herself desperate for them to pay off the daughter's uh, Brianna's hospital bill. She got herself embroiled in the Yahoo Boys Nigerian Prince scam. You can't make this up. But basically it's the type where they will send you an email saying that you've they want to park some money in your account uh, for a time, and all you have to do is write, they want to park like 10, 10 or 15, $50,000, whatever it is, in your account uh, just for a minute, and then all it would, all it takes for you to do that is a deposit of, sent to them of $500 so that they can do all the wire transfer fees and, and that sort of thing, but yet they will leave you a hefty sum of that money in your bank account after they use it. Well, she got caught up in that. And of course, we all know how that works. They take your money and disappear or they park that, uh, they send you a check for $50,000 or whatever it is. And you put it in your account that um, that check bounces and you're left owing the fees after they make, a, make off with your money. And so basically by March of 2006, the family was uh, entangled in uh, bad checks to the tune of about $18,000. And uh, what Mary had been doing to cover it is going uh, from bank to bank in the local area, opening new accounts just in her name, uh, depositing uh, a check from another account that she knew was going to bounce because the money wasn't in there, and then she would open that bank account, she would take her temporary checks from that new account, she would write another check for any expenses that they had, and then she would go open another account. This scam was, pre is, was pretty common in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s when the writing of checks was still kind of a thing because there was what you called the float time. You had time between the time you wrote a check and when it would actually hit your bank. You had about three to five days, and a lot of people, I did this myself, when I was in college, if, if I was about to get paid and I knew it, but I needed groceries that weekend, I would write what I knew was a bad check, 
But by the time it cleared my bank, the money would be there. So it was kind of a common practice, but she was doing it knowingly with checks that she knew would never clear. And so by uh, March 21st, 2006, uh, one of the accounts, the, the joint account she had with Matthew at the local Selmer, Tennessee bank, was overdrawn by $5,000. And uh, teachers at Mary's school, it was her first day substitute teaching at this particular elementary school, uh, noticed that her first day there, she seemed rather distracted. She spent a lot of time on her cell phone in the parking lot. She would give the kids assignments and walk out in the hall to make a phone call. They said she spent a lot of time on that phone that day and had a very worried look on her face. So basically what it was is she was talking with the um, branch pre or the branch manager of their local bank and was trying to convince them to let her take Matthew's name off the account because they were saying they needed to alert him about what was going on. The bank manager would not allow it, would not work out a payment plan or anything. He, they, they were insisting that she bring Matthew, who was a well-known preacher in the town, into the bank to settle this once and for all. So she knew she was going to have to tell Matthew exactly what was going on. And uh, when she left school that day, uh, she was very depressed, very, very upset, but that did not stop her from stopping by the local uh, Blockbuster video and renting uh, a DVD for the night and picked up a takeout pizza on the way home. And uh, they settled in for a night of uh, family fun. All this time, Matthew is kind of ignorant to what's going on because, as I said, he kind of let her handle the finances. But uh, no one knows if he ever really told her, if she ever really told him what was going on with the bank. And unfortunately, we'll never know because uh, Matthew died uh, at Mary's hands sometime between midnight and 5 a.m. Uh, from March 21st to March 22nd, 2006. March 22nd, 2006 was a Wednesday, and in the South, that means church night. That's church through the week night. Often it's Bible study, but it can also be a full church, often when assistant pastors uh, preach. But Matthew, being the only pastor at the church, was due there to preach, and he was late. He never showed up. Mary never showed up. They tried to call his cell phone several times, the church elders, and they never got... Um, anybody on the phone, so one of the elders took over the sermon and a group of elders went up to the parsonage because, again, it's owned by the church. They have every right to go inspect it. They walked up to the parsonage to check on Mary and Matthew. They found the spare key in the garage and opened it and went in. Nothing seemed really out of place until they moved back to the bedroom and they found Matthew Winkler face up obviously expired in a pool of blood on the floor at the foot of the bed. And they immediately called 911. Uh, they told them that their pastor was dead. They did not know where the wife and children were. The first thing that kind of flew into the elder's head was that, oh, Mary has been kidnapped. They never once suspected foul play. They just suspected that she had been kidnapped. Someone killed Matthew and kidnapped her and the kids. So they called in not only the the, mur the obvious murder they had just found, they called in a missing persons on Mary and all three girls. The police arrived. They did an examination. Matthew had obviously been shot with a single uh, shotgun blast to the back. And according to the forensic scientists on the scene, there was a huge uh, stain of blood on one side of the bed. So obviously he had been shot while lying in bed, probably on his stomach because he had been shot in the back. And uh, obviously, whoever did it had taken the weapon with them. They saw no evidence of anything else in the house. And they're, they immediately put out a all points bulletin on Mary and all three girls. An Amber Alert was put out on Patricia 8, Mary Alice 6, Brianna 1, as well as Mary and their minivan. And that minivan was pulled over in Orange Beach, Alabama, near Gulf Shores on March 23rd. 2006 uh, while, while doing an illegal U-turn. You would think that if you were on the run that you would at least drive according to traffic rules, but I don't write, I don't write this. Truth is definitely stranger than fiction sometimes. 
and they were immediately pulled over. Uh, Mary was arrested. I will draw. Mary offered no resistance. She confessed to what she had done. Uh, the children were uh, sent back to uh, actually Matthew's family in uh, Woodbury, Tennessee. And uh, she was taken into custody and then extradited from Alabama back to Tennessee to stand trial, where she was indicted by a Tennessee grand jury on June 12, 2006, uh, for the first degree murder of her husband, Pastor Matthew Winkler. Um, her bond hearing was held on June 30th, and it was there that a, uh, after questioning by the TBI, they read her statement where she said that she doesn't remember ever pulling the trigger and hurting Matthew. She says she does remember Matthew being on the floor next to the bed. He looked at her and said, why? And she simply responded, I'm sorry, and left the house. She, to this day, says that she does not remember pulling the trigger. And she took the girl, she took the shotgun, she took everything and left the house. The shotgun was found in the back of the minivan at her arrest. Uh, the one thing that she did say is that Matthew was cruel to her. He was verbally and mentally abusive as well as physically, and that she was so terrified of his reaction to what had happened with the Nigerian scam and then the, uh, the check hiding that she used to try to cover it, that she was really afraid that uh, he would beat her to death and that he often uh, would turn his anger toward the children and that that was her life. And she basically confessed that, uh, I guess that that was the moment that my, uh, my nasty came out, talking about the shooting. The bond ending here, uh, ended with uh, her being a $750,000 bond being set. Her defense team, led by her lawyer, Steve Faris Sr., uh, said that there was absolutely, that was tantamount to no bond being granted at all, and he argued that it be struck made lower. That was denied, and so Mary Winkler spent all the time from her arrest through her trial in jail. Up until August uh, of 2006, when she, when a friends and church members finally posted bail for her, and she was bailed out and allowed to live with uh, some friends of hers, Rudolph and Kathy Thomason in McMcVale, Tennessee, a town very close to Selmer, and was uh, lived there with them until her trial commenced on April 9th, 2007. During the trial, her entire defense team, five lawyers that represented her pro bono stated that Mary was an abused woman, that she had no knowledge of the shooting, and that Matthew had, in fact, been the cause of his own death from being an overbearing, abusive husband. Uh, she took the trial in her own defense, which is very unusual for uh, an accused to do. I, I think I mentioned that in the Jody Arias case, that normally accused murderers do not take the stand in their own defense, but she did, and the most pressing part of that testimony was when she testified to the what she called unnatural sexual acts that Matthew would pressure her into and we'll drop a clip right here of that. That she was incapable of forming the requisite intent uh, could wind up in an acquittal if it was an accident and that she has that gap in her memory about the gun you know I was doing my routine and then all of a sudden the gun was in her <laughs> and it went out and then her actions after that that she was still afraid that he would think she did it on purpose and she is not sophisticated enough you're right I think to to be coached into being such a great actress so I think that is it was a huge day for the defense and I really believe that the the defense lawyers are or anything but you know the murder charge so manslaughter not guilty quite possible on either either one okay let me ask Sarge a little bit about this that shoe sitting up next to her that big giant platform so out of but character so in, incongruous I think, yeah I think that's excellent for them to keep that up there as much as they can if if the defendant was more sophisticated you you might psychologically convince that that jury as the prosecutor look she just got mad she'd had yeah. enough of being pushed around and dominated this woman is is not resonating with me in that fashion well look here is the issue as you have said and you've said before you know the heart of what she has said is my ugly came out 
Now, the question here is, was she aware of what she was doing when her ugly came out, or was this some kind of, as Lynn Yeager said, a dissociative state? Uh, Mary Winkler on the stand came off as very downtrodden. She looked at her shoes. She only looked at the judge or the jury when she was forced to. And she just seemed like a very sheltered child on the on the stage. Her family had come over from Knoxville, was very supportive, were in the gallery there for her. Um, eventually, uh, the, trial, uh, the trial only took about 24 hours on uh, April 19th. Uh, the jury came back within a matter of hours uh, with a verdict of guilty, but not to first-degree murder, which is what the prosecution wanted. They came back with guilty to voluntary manslaughter. Um, after the trial, and each juror was poised, uh, polled at the end, it appeared to be an even split between the male and female jurors. A jury foreman, Bill Berry, would say later that he was shocked that every female member of the jury wanted her to walk free with absolutely no penalties. Uh, but he managed to guide them toward a guilty for voluntary manslaughter as a compromise between first degree murder and just letting her walk free. He said he didn't buy the whole downtrodden act. He thought it was just that, an act, while the women were a little more sympathetic. But, uh, she was actually sentenced to a very unusual type of sentence as well. On June 8th, 2007, she was sentenced to 210 days in prison for the uh, murder of her husband, or rather the voluntary manslaughter of her husband, former pastor Matthew Winkler. And she was given credit for the nearly five months she had served between the time she was arrested and the time that she finally made bond. And 60 days of those days remaining, she was allowed to spend, not in jail, but in a mental health facility in Middle Tennessee, which was never disclosed. And then she was to be put on a supervised probation for the rest of her sentence. So essentially, she walked from the courtroom to a transport that took her to a mental health facility where she spent 60 days. And then upon her release from there, she was put on probation and never really served any time, lengthy time in prison, except for what she had served prior to uh, being tried. Um, as you can imagine, this was hugely controversial. Uh, even Oprah Winfrey in 2007 said that the jail time just seemed way too short uh, for what happened, that no one quite bought the, the what they tended to be an act on stage, uh, on, on stage, that is, in front of the courtroom. Uh, men's rights groups went crazy saying that it was just um, a murderer walking free. It was a very quick trial, a very quick sentencing, but by all regards, and an unprecedented lenient sentence in my part. Now, I wasn't there. I don't know. I remember it being on television. I think I watched a Snap episode about it at one point. And I remember um, there was a lot of controversy that not everyone bought, bought the whole Abused Wife Act. Now, do I think that Matthew was probably abusive? Yes, I, I do. I absolutely buy that he was, he was probably abusive. It was just based on what her sister said and the um, type of denomination he was brought up in. I think it was just that even if it wasn't physical abuse, which her own father said he saw bruises on her, it was probably mental and emotional abuse. So I can kind of understand um, a woman lashing out, of course, but then you put into it all of the the strange financial shenanigans, and I'm just not sure what to make of it. This is one that I am absolutely divided on. I, 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 I want to show mercy to Mary because I believe she was abused, but yet I don't think that shooting somebody in the back and then sort of putting on this whole act in front of the court to garner sympathy was good. I, I also believe she got off much more lenient than, I mean, most people that are convicted of voluntary manslaughter are sentenced to like two to four years. And so what happened there? 
maybe I would feel better about it if she had served at least some lengthy jail time, but she didn't, and I hope that justice was served. I, I don't know in this case. Let me know what you think down below. This is one of those cases It's just, you know, uh, but the her trying times in court were not over because she ended up with a in a huge custody battle with Matthew's parents, Dan and Diane uh, Winkler, for um, custody of the three girls. They had put in a petition to adopt them. In addition, they had gotten control of an over $200,000 trust fund that was set aside by church, family, friends, and the public for the girls. And at the end, Mary was allowed to have her children back. She took them with her back to uh, McMinnville. And that, that she continued to work in the same dry cleaner she had worked for years. That was in 2008. In 2010, Dan and Diane Winkler were ordered to pay back the $175,000 of that over $200,000 trust fund that they had spent and were unable to prove where the money went. Many people uh, were of the opinion that in the year and a half they had the children, it didn't require $175,000. So again, shenanigans. The apples don't, don't far fall far from the tree there, folks. But uh, anyway, uh, there was a couple of movies, television shows, even a song written about this case, but Mary Winkler has kind of disappeared into the mist. She's living a very private life, and uh, as far as I know, she's alive and well, as is her girls. So I wish those girls all the luck in the world. I'm still not fully convinced that justice was exactly served in this case. But I wasn't there. No one knows what goes on behind closed doors, you know? Uh, yeah. This is a, this is a hard one. Uh, let me know what you think down below. And with that being said, until next time, Keto Comic.